And may you put in what you want us to hear, what you want us to learn, what you want us to do, what you want us to see. For your word declares, nothing is hidden from your sight. May we surrender, as, as our brother Ryan just said. May we just lay it all at your feet. We have nothing left to hide. There's no place to hide anymore, God. Have your way that we would be closer to you, better at doing this life. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, the book of Hebrews, as we've learned, is Paul's letter to Jewish believers who try to add their own little thing to their belief. So many times in the church today, people want to have their own particular bend, their own particular style, their own, some church as well. The word says that it's your words that do this. So if we declare healing, then you're healed. If you declare riches, then you're rich. If you de so many things that the word <coughs> suggests that people then enumerate as the final word. For an understanding of knowing these things, guys, the best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. And that's why God gave us teachers. That's why God gave you pastors. That's why God gave us those that have walked a little further, like a big brother for you sisters, like a big sister. Well, I think God is leading me too. And you fill in the blank and say, you know what? I better ask somebody first before I just follow my unction, my feeling, my desire even. We talked about that on Tuesday. So much of our life is following our emotions and doing what we feel is best. But I want a girlfriend. But I want a boyfriend. But I want that job. That must be God. And, he, and God says, I've appointed people to help you through this so that scripture can interpret itself with a teacher. That's why it's so important to some that say, well, I really don't go to church, but you know, I do spend a lot of time reading and in prayer. And that's why the Bible specifically says, don't, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren as the manner of some. This is the place where you come because you get help here. But not only that, even where you are now, every, I could say without reservation, every single one of you guys, wherever you are today, there's somebody here that needs what you have. So not only are you staying away from those that can help you, but worse, you're staying away from those that need your help. <coughs> so as Paul explains how this works to the Jewish believers, he tells them, verse 1, chapter 5, the book of Hebrews, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Give me your attention, please. He's just trying to explain them logically. He's saying, listen, God didn't create a pastor, create a priest in the old days since he was speaking to Jewish believers. He's trying to explain to them, listen, the reason God chose Aaron as the priest is because he was a man and he could understand your weaknesses. You guys that come to church here, if you know part of my testimony, you know the circumstance and situation of my life. I can't condescend to anybody. I made a bigger mess of my life than most of y'all did. God rescued me. And he used me, so I'm preaching to you. And even though my New York Italian attitude will sometimes shine through as condescension, it's not. It's mercy and sympathy, I know. So many people say, well, you, you tell it, not to me, but they, they tell each other, you know, you gotta tell the truth in, in, in love. The truth in love. That's not what the Bible says more than anything else. It says to tell the truth with mercy. To tell somebody the truth in mercy, listen, you say to them, you're really screwing up your life, and I understand. You know, there's that saying, I just want to keep it real. I just got to keep it real. Listen, don't keep it real, okay? Keep it real merciful. How's that? Because the Bible says, be careful where you stand lest you fall. You condescendingly try to tell somebody else about why their life is messed up and yours are so great. You're, you're setting your feet up on banana peels, man. He's telling them, I put priests and pastors in place because 
They understand your weaknesses. And then he goes on to say, verse 2 again, He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weaknesses. The first thing that happens when people come to church, usually as they look around, they go, Oh, these people are all so holy, and they all know I'm filthy. I don't belong here. You know how many of my friends especially from the gym, especially from the store. They come out and they say, oh, if I walk into your church, I'll burst into flames. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> if Junior didn't burst into flames, <laughs> you're probably safe. I mean, how many of you guys can say your first three services were either drunk or with a hangover? <laughs> if I didn't burst into flames, you're in the right place. You're amongst sinners. Verse 3. Because of this he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer, offer sacrifices for sins. Now again, what he's explaining to them, please stay with me, is in the Jewish faith, mixing their personal Judaism with Christianity, which was, later he explains why that is so wrong, priests were there to help men sacrifice. You were a Jew in Old Testament times. You brought your ox, you brought your goat, you brought your sheep to the temple and you said, I've had a very rough month, I've had a very rough week, a very rough day. This is my sacrifice for sin. And the priest would say, okay, well, let's take the lamb that you're offering to God. You put your hand on top of it. They cut it open, it dies, they cut the belly, they pull out certain parts of the inerts, they offer them up on a sacrifice, it gets cooked, and up the smoke goes, and God sitting in heaven like a holy barbecue says, that's a sweet smelling aroma. Now you understand why your sin costs you. Big uproar right now in our country, everybody talking about it. I can't believe how many people are talking about one guy who said homosexuality was a sin. I cannot believe it. It's like, get a clue. He didn't just say that homosexuality was a sin, but greediness is a sin. Listen, if you start listing sins, who could stand? Who could stand? Nobody but God. So he's telling about the priests, how God appointed the priests to do these things to help people. Continuing on, verse 4, he says, And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, for a minister like myself, keep this in mind, that if you have an aspiration of being a pastor, the best way to do it is to stay in church and stay connected to God. If you are one of those young brothers here, yes, I want to be a pastor, what should I do? Don't do nothing. Wait for God to open the door to call you. Do you know Calvary Chapel as a movement? Pastor Chuck was not called to Calvary Chapel till he was almost 40 years old. And yet now there's a thousand churches plus, 1,500 worldwide, millions of people. God doesn't need, he's not in a rush. He's not waiting for you to be weaker, strong. He's not. If you want to serve God, then wait till you are called by God. Let God do the work. Be the, get a job. Be the best person, the best employee, the best worker, the best everything you can be there. And God will tell you, pull you right out. I never heard anybody say, man, you know, I really want to be a pastor, but I decided to stay a truck driver instead. Listen, if you're a truck driver and you're loving Jesus, he'll open the doors on every ministry opportunity for you. Don't be afraid. God's the kind of God who's, okay, here's your future. It's all in here. Here it is. And you are loving God. You're going to church. You're studying the word. You're being faithful. You're doing your best to be holy. And your father in heaven goes, <laughs> I'm going to hide it from you now. No. He's your heavenly father. He's your father. It is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's actually following you around with your future. Come on, come on, get, 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 get. So many people think he's, he's, <laughs> he's your future. <laughs> I'm going to put it here. And then you go there and he goes, no, 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 no I'm going to put it here. <laughs> That's not God. That's not my father. 
Continuing. Verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, Today you are my, you are my son, today I have begotten you. He also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He's quoting from Psalm 2 and from Psalm 110. And what he's saying is, Christ himself, according to Philippians, says that even though he was equal to God, at no point did he ever consider himself greater than the Father. That he submitted, now, side note, completely, Completely different from the subject. Ladies, what an opportunity. What an opportunity you have. We're, as we prayed over Janelli and we prayed over um, Gleason, what an opportunity she has to prove how much like Christ she is. Now she's just as smart as him. She's certainly better looking than him. And yet she has the opportunity to submit herself underneath her husband just to say, I'm going to be like Christ. And even though I'm just as important as my husband, I'm going to show him submission even when I don't have to, but I willingly place myself underneath to follow him because that's God ordained. What an opportunity. Same exact thing he's saying Christ did. Even though he was equal to God, he said, I need somebody. The Father said, somebody's going to go down to earth. Funny story. I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but last night it was about 1.30 in the morning. My little Cammy Joy, she's six years old. For you guys that know, she had to go to the bathroom. And something about kids and going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, they can't just go. They have to call and tell you they have to go. Yeah. So there was, Daddy, Daddy. I'll get it, baby. I'll get it. I get up. I got to go potty. I got to go potty. Take her to the bathroom. All of a sudden, I, I, I put, okay, you go to bed afterward. And I go back in the room all of a sudden, a cockroach, a cockroach. Daddy, it's a cockroach. <laughs> and I thought to myself, we're in Florida. <laughs> and we live in the Everglades. Just ignore it. He ain't bothering you. I mean, really, think about it. Has anybody ever been bit by a cockroach? Uh, no. I mean, they live a little tiny piece of poop once in a while, but you clean it up. It's, not, it's a cockroach. So I go in the bathroom, and of course, I have bare feet, but <laughs> that doesn't bother me in the middle of the night. And I go, ah! Oh, <laughs> and I take it, and I throw it in a bowl. Did I just upset her? Is she crying? Yeah. Baby, I'm telling a cool story. Oh, oh. oh honey, I'm sorry. You got to get used to that. Your sisters already know. I'm going to embarrass them all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cam Joy. So I threw it in a, in a toilet, and she wants me to. I can't flush it. I'll flush it, baby. Right? Didn't I flush it for you? So I flushed the cockroach, and I thought to myself, why doesn't God do that to me? <laughs> Am I not a, a cockroach in his world? So great and so awesome is he, so mighty. What do I have to offer God? I mean, anything at all? Why did he choose me and show me grace and give me mercy? And not just every time I messed up, every time I did something. I do this, certainly. I scare people all the time. <laughs> All the time I poop in their house and tell them things. I just do stupid stuff. And God never looks and goes, you know what? I'm just tired of you. And I thought, man, I thought, I'm going to tell the church this tomorrow. Because there's got to be a reason I'm up at 1.30 in the morning when I got to get up real early. <laughs> The Lord Jesus himself submitted willingly underneath the Father's plan. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications and vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Please, give me your attention. Dull of hearing. He says, you become dull of hearing. Do you know what happens to us? 
we get about that fifth, sixth year in the Lord, we understand. I've read the Bible a couple times. We start to understand. We get to be dry and crusty. We mellow. Like mayonnaise, we mellow. I hate mayonnaise. It's disgusting. He says the Lord Jesus was perfected through his suffering. He was perfected through his suffering. But if he was already a perfect man, then why did he have to suffer? I mean, he's a, a man who sinned not. Here's a man who was literally God, but according to Scripture, literally took off his God powers, as it were, according to the, the doctrine of kenosis, that he literally put it aside and said, listen, I'm going to show you how to live. I'm going to put aside everything that is in me that is God. I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to walk as a man to show you how. And here he showed us in his suffering. Now, when you're in a church and they tell you your sufferings are only because of your lack of faith, I question it now and I go, wait a second. If the Lord Jesus suffered, then why should not I also suffer? Hold your place in Hebrews. We're going to come back. Turn to Luke chapter 22, just a few pages to the left. Let me show you what he is explaining here. What The Apostle Paul whom just maybe 35 to 50 years earlier was explaining in the book of Luke in chapter 22. And let's see if, if you can relate some of this to your own life at some point in time. Because, and now this is extremely important, he said you've become dull of hearing. Listen to me. The biggest problem that Christians have is forgetting that this life is about suffering. We forget he suffered, we suffer. We lose the... We, here's what we do. We tell ourselves we're fake or we're not real. Because I still feel certain things. I shouldn't lust anymore in my heart. I shouldn't want to do this or I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't... Man, I'm at the bar with my friends and, and I want to get smashed, but why? If, if, if God is in me, why do I still feel this way? So many stop going to church because of something they did last night, said last night, and they go, man, I can't go to church. Why? Well, everybody there is a hypocrite. Why? Uh, I, I know what they did. You mean what you did? Well, what, what I did, what they did, what I did. And some people condemn themselves, or worse, they get mad at God, which is the vast majority of atheists that I know. Since there's absolutely no science they can rely on to deny the existence of God, it's their sin. And instead of saying God is merciful for his mercy endures forever, they get mad at God. And they stop going to church because God must be mad at them. Why? Because I slept last night with somebody, or I drank something last night, or I took something, or I robbed somebody in business, or I did this that I shouldn't. And they condemn themselves. And they don't go to church. They stay away from God. They stay away from God's people. They fight. They forget to fight. Look in, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. Go down to... Thirty-nine. He told his apostles of the things that were going to pass. They all pledged their perfect allegiance. I will never leave you. I am with you always. Now, I'm going to read, but I'm also going to paraphrase from some of the other Gospels. Quick Bible lesson, in case you didn't know. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what's called the Gospels. The word gospel in Greek means literally the good news. Those are the stories of Jesus Christ's life and death from the perspective of those that were with him. So that's why they don't match up. And those that don't like the Bible, those that tell you, well, if, if, if all these things contradict each other, and how, oh, they don't contradict each other. They actually accentuate each other when you read them properly. 
Verse 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He told his apostles he was going through something really heavy, possibly the worst situation in his life, and he wanted them to pray. Pray with me, please. Some people, nah, don't pray for me. Listen to me. If Christ could solicit prayer for his life, you too can. Don't be afraid to ask somebody to pray for you. I love that about our church. There's prayer always breaking out. People could be screaming after the service is over. The kids are running up and down here and in there. But all of a sudden, three or four people get together and start praying. You're like, oh, shoot, those people. It's okay. You can make noise when we pray. It doesn't distract me. I'm going to pray anyway. Be one of those people when somebody says, hey, could you pray for me for such and such? Say, you know what? Let me pray for you now because I'll probably forget later anyway. Let's just do it now. Be one of those people, those crazy, let's pray now people. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Please, before we finish that line there, he goes into the garden where he's familiar. He has a place that he always went to pray. Also very important. Guys, you can't make this life without prayer. In prayer is when you hear from God. In prayer is where you receive the peace of God. Sometimes we find ourselves just reading the Word, and it kind of, you get a little bit stiff if you just read the Word. You've got to spend some time in prayer. A good 15 to 20 minutes in the morning is a, is, a, is a good guideline, a good start just to ask. Here, he had, the Lord Jesus had a place. He had a garden that he used to go to every morning before the sun come up just to spend some time with his father in prayer. Good, good routine. He went to the garden where you're off and he said, Father... Take this cup from before me. Now, what does he mean? What's this? Listen, let's make believe that this is a cup. The Father gave him his future. This is your future. And he took it and he said, No, thank you. I don't want it. Take this cup. Wait a second. Are you saying that the Lord Jesus disobeyed the Father who's in heaven? Disobeyed? No. Questioned? Yeah. You see, God loves faith-filled doubt. God loves faith-filled questions. Why, God? Are you asking why because you want to know His perfect plan? Or are you asking why because you don't want His perfect plan? That's a good question. Now, you've got to answer that yourself. Father, take this cup from me. Look at the last part of that verse, though. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see that? Some of you guys have been through some horrible things. God has allowed some horrible things to ha happen in your life. And I mean horrible. I know a brother in here who is driving a vehicle and killed somebody. And he came in here and he was just devastated. And you want to talk about, Father, take, let, let me wake up and, and have this not happen to me. You know, let me wake up and have it be a nightmare. Let, I know some people in here that is, have lost children. And they just want to wake up. Take this from me. No, 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 no. Husbands that have lost wives. and Take this away. But he says... Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Is that the latter part of your prayer to God? It should be. You know why? Because every horrible thing that's happened in your life, God's going to make it good. Do you believe that? Or do you believe that the reason it happened so horribly is because you don't have enough faith? Because that's not scriptural. You're going to say that Jesus didn't have enough faith? That's why he was going through this horrible problem? Be careful of those that would proclaim such. Now, for you that have been going to Calvary Chapel or a good Bible teaching church your whole life, believe me, this is no great revelation. But for you that come from that faith, the name it and claim it church, the word of faith movement, I'm saying stuff to you now that's sitting in your spirit. And what's happening to you right now is I'm saying this stuff to you. 
and your spirit is receiving it with gladness, but your mind is like, wait a second, this is not what I heard. Wait a second, this is not what I learned. This can't be. Do you know how many churches I've visited people in the hospital and their church won't come to see them because they say the reason they're sick and ill is because of their lack of faith. This happens, guys. This is reality of our, I want to say the body of Christ, but Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So fervent was his prayer, so torn with not wanting. He, you understand, the Lord Jesus walked the earth. For the last three years of his ministry, healing and loving and setting people free, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. He had spent the last three years, and he's looking at God saying, Father, how can this be the way? How can my death bring more life? It can't be. And you know what the Father did? Did it say he said to him, no, son, I'm with you, don't worry about it? No. You know what he said? And here's what he said. I said it once, I'm not going to say it again. Everything else after that is disobedience. The father literally, I mean, not in those exact words, but it didn't answer. He didn't answer him. He sent an angel to minister to his spirit, knowing that even though, and this is the hard part, going forward into something that was more painful, yet was feeling in his spirit better. How does that happen? Guys, sometimes you do something and you know it's the harder road. It's the narrow road. And it doesn't feel right in your flesh, but you somehow sense, experience, somehow it's right. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen, anybody on that? Okay. The Father didn't say, come on, you can do it, you can go to the cross, I'm with... He didn't say anything. He, he said it once. For some of us, we want to test God. I said that he's not the right one for you. That's why I closed the door. But he didn't text me yesterday. But he didn't call me yesterday. I just, I don't, I just want to find out if he's okay. He's fine. Leave him alone. But, but if I just would, if you would just leave him alone, the plan of God and the real man God's chosen, and if it's him, God could then work in his heart. But what's happening to some of you ladies is you're following a guy who you keep rescuing and God wants to get his heart. You rescue him. You lift him up. He goes, ah, I don't need God. Why? Because I got you. Let him be. Let his broken heart. Listen, women and men are so different in that way, guys. And I'm not trying to be comedic. I'm just trying to explain to you. Ladies, you can shop for like nine hours and think about nothing else. Yeah. My wife has shopped for the last three days. She hasn't called me twice in three days. <laughs> and then she gets home, oh, honey, I miss you. I love you. If you miss me, you love me, why don't you call me at least? She says, you could have called me. I'm like, no way. I'm not calling you. <laughs> now, I'm agonizing because my wife's not calling me, but I'm not going to call her. And she's shopping and not thinking about me even a little. <laughs> now, why does it work like that, guys? Why <laughs> But guys, when they're brokenhearted, they could walk into the street and a truck can hit them. Their leg, they can drag a broken leg behind them. Broken heart. Your leg's broken, I don't care. My wife didn't call me while she was shopping. That's you guys, not me. He said it once. Father, if this is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly that his sweat became great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer, he'd come to his disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. You gotta be in prayer, man. 
You've got to be in prayer. You know, you know that Bible verse, and, and a lot of people don't understand it, and, and it, it really took me probably 15 years to understand it. It's a Bible verse that says, lead me not into temptation. And people say, well, the Bible says that God doesn't test people. Does God tempt people? Listen, he, the Lord Jesus, when he said that, he's trying to tell you your flesh is weak, and God will not lead you into a temptation however you will come across temptation and you can literally pray God keep temptation away from me have you ever prayed a prayer ladies God please keep the man who is going to destroy my life away from me please God knowing how weak I am I need you desperately God I pray this prayer all the time God please keep that business situation you know you see them numbers and there's lots of zeros at the end and you're like oh my goodness but it's a gray area no it's not it's not a gray area don't do it keep it away from me then just keep it away my flesh is way too weak got to be in prayer. If you're not about prayer, if you're not about fasting, then you're not going to be ready when those temptations come across your path. Verse 47, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus with a kiss. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? To me, that's one of the saddest lines in the entire Bible. This is one of his best friends. He'd just been ministering with this guy for the last three years. And Judas sold him out for money and for power. And he gave him a sign, another part of the Bible. And I think in Matthew, it talks about how he, Judas got together with those that hated the Lord Jesus. And here's pieces of 30 pieces of silver. He says, listen, I'll point him out to you with a sign. I'll go up and I'll kiss him. So here's Jesus in the garden with his apostles, with his best friends, with his buds, his 12 buds, who just swore to him they'd never leave nor forsake him. And here comes a detachment of troops. Some say 100. And they come in there, and Judas is leading them. That's what Judas wanted. He wanted to be in charge. And there he was with his guys. And he saw the Lord, and he walked up. And he says to him, Rabbi! And he gave him a kiss. And the Lord Jesus, is he betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Ladies, it's too easy here, but you're being betrayed with kisses. Be careful. Be careful about him who would kiss you before he goes to the world and to the Father and says, yes, she is the one, the only one, forever. He's the only one worth your kisses or anything else. Ever been betrayed with a kiss? Show of hands, ready? Really? Anybody here been betrayed with a kiss? Yeah? The rest of you guys with your hands on a lion. We've all been betrayed by kisses. The Lord Jesus knew and knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows our pain. This is exactly what we're looking at in Hebrews. Do you understand? We have a high priest who can sympathize. God is not some faraway God. Ladies, I know it's harder for you. It's a little easier for the guys because he was a guy. He is a guy. But ladies, you have a heavenly father. You have a heavenly father who has a son whom he sent to earth who is betrayed with a kiss also. And he says, I know how you feel, ladies. Sister, you have a man here who will hold you in his arms without any other ulterior motive. How awesome is that, ladies? How awesome is that? To be able to just, I just, just hold me. I mean, even, even now, after 25 years, <laughs> my wife wants to hold me. It's like, <laughs> good. No, not that. Well, then what? Just hold me. Why? <laughs> is, isn't that... The ladies know what I'm talking about, or what? Yeah, yeah just, just hold me. <laughs> Nothing else? <laughs> Guys don't get that. <laughs> Guys are like my wife's car. All you gotta do is press a button. You don't even have to put the key in and turn. Just press a button. It starts right up. <laughs> the key. Where's the key? It's, it's in my purse. <laughs> 
So you guys got the key in your purse, so you gotta do is press the button. <laughs> Can we just sit in the car for a while without the car started? That's ridiculous. We, we have to go somewhere. No, we don't. Well, you have a man who doesn't want to go anywhere. He wants to go everywhere you want to go and bless you along the way and wants nothing from you. <laughs> when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. The book of Matthew says it was Peter. He saw all the people coming out to try and get Jesus. He pulls out his sword. No way! And he goes to cut a guy's ear off, cut a guy's head off, and he, the guy must have ducked or something, and shoom, cut his ear off. And the Lord Jesus, according to Scripture, said, Peter, everyone who takes up the sword dies with the sword. Don't you think I can call my father and get 12 legions of angels to put an end to this now? We must fulfill scripture. Put your sword away. And that's us guys, and that always messes us up. Smash, smash good. Smash good, this is time to smash. Righteous indignation, we smash. And the Lord says, no, now not the time to smash. No smash, no smash. Then what do? Be still and know that I'm God. No smash. And now we're confused and we're dismayed, especially being rebuked. <laughs> but I thought, and the Lord Jesus, so amazing. So, I mean, could you imagine? Like, like, I love the way Ken Graves puts it. He goes, and then the guy goes and picks up his ear and puts it back on his head like he's Mr. Potato Head or something like that. <laughs> he says, permit even this. I mean, could you imagine? That? I want you to imagine, it's a garden. And we're not talking about garden in the, in the, they had no electricity. This is a bunch of, how did he go about finding his ear? <laughs> Hold on a second. Shine a light over here. <laughs> oh, I got it. Here it is. Here it is. It's like he's Mr. Potato Head, right? <laughs> now, I want to know something. Malchus gets his ear cut off. The Lord Jesus puts, on, puts it back on again. How do you go and follow this guy and watch him get beat up, crucified? How do, you, how do you do it? What does Malchus, the rest of his day, look like? The next three days of his life, I mean, when he was on the cross, I mean, how did this guy, how do you move from there? Yeah, we're going to go faster here. Verse 52, but then Jesus said to the chief priest, captain of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs when I was with you daily in the temple? You did not seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. Let's go over this, the rest of this when we go through Luke. Go back to Hebrews, please. Hebrews 5. Pick it back up again in verse 12. Actually, uh, real quick, you see it says the order of Melchizedek. In the book of Genesis, I want to say it's the 14th chapter, there's a story of Abram. He was not yet Abraham. He's still named Abram. And Abram rescued his nephew Lot and, and got Lot back. And you guys can look at it again. Genesis 14, I think it is. 10 or 14, one or two. And he rescues him. And when he comes back with all kinds of booty, uh, all kinds of uh, treasures, the first thing he does is he gives a tithe or a 10% of it to a man they call the, king of, the priest of the king of Salem, a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek, all through scripture, his name is mentioned. He has no beginning. He has no end. He has no lineage. So every time you see, now some scholars, and I don't know where I stand on this, I don't have enough evidence, say that that was actually a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus himself. He is Melchizedek. I don't know if I see that. However, it wouldn't be a, a tragedy to think as such. So he is being telling him that Christ, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, you're a priest forever. You're the one who has no beginning, no end. You are, were, and always will be. 
Verse 12, though. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Please give me your attention. Here's where we close. Last thought. You may even close your Bible if you want because we're not going anyplace else. But focus in now. Here's, here's my closing point and message. Next week, we're going to look at what Paul refers to as milk. Real quick, verse 1 of chapter 6, I'll read it to you. Therefore, leaving discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And then he lists the elementary, the things you ought to know. So next week, we're going to look basically at the foundation of the faith. Things in Christ you got to know. But here's what's happened. So many of us have go to churches, so many of you go to churches where they don't teach the Bible. Myself going to Catholic church growing up. I didn't know nothing. You stand, you sit, you get a cookie, you leave, you leave some money. You didn't know. I didn't know any better. I never knew. Go to church 15 years. Who's Jesus? We're going to look at that next week, the things that Paul considers milk. Now, I want you to understand when we go through these next week, want pen in hand, know these things, that that is why at Calvary Chapel, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we go one, at, I don't want you to miss nothing, I want you to know everything, that's why we started in Matthew a few years ago, here we are in the book of Hebrews, you all that have been here, we're just going to go through, we're going to go all the way through the Revelation, you know what happens at the end of the book, we're going to go right back to Matthew, start over again. Same thing on Wednesday night. We started in Genesis. We're now in front. This is how you learn. This is how you grow. Why? So important. Please come back to me. Look at it says again in verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Don't you want to know the direction of your life? Do you ever look at TV at these sports guys, whether you watch basketball, football, MMA, whatever sport you look at and go, man, those guys are something. How do you think those men and women got there? The, the Winter Olympics is coming up. You ever see those people do the skiing thing? Foom, and they fly through, and you're like, oh my goodness. You know how they did it? By doing it all the time. They didn't just learn. Bruce Lee had the greatest saying in the world. And I, I use that as an example because that's what I know. He said, a punch is just a punch until you break it down. And then you realize your feet have to be planted in a certain direction. Your hips have to turn. Your shoulder turns over. Your hand is twi A punch is just a punch. And then after you got all the mechanics of it down, you know what you realize? Punch is just a punch. There's so many more things. Prayer, it's prayer. But it's just prayer. But we learn the deeper things. And then when you get them all down, you know what you find out? It's just prayer. And you keep going. And now all of a sudden you learn prayer. You learn Bible study. You learn the elements. And then what happens? It's not just knowledge that you're discerning between good and evil. Now you look at your marriage and it's going right. And you're raising your kids and they're growing in the Lord. And your job is excelling and you're making more money because now you are faithful and you learn diligence. <coughs> and this is what we're trying to do. Why did you come here if not to change? I come here to change. I don't want to be the same husband. My wife don't want me to be the same husband. Be sure of that. I want to be a better father tomorrow. And I'm going to get there a little bit at a time. It don't, they don't come down that mountain and jump 300 feet in the air by going, I can do this. No question, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this. Have you ever skied before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. Have you ever jumped before? No, but I can ski. <laughs> do you know that happens in MMA all the time? That's why they created something in Florida called amateur MMA. Guys watch TV and they think they're good. I could do that, man. I'm telling you, in the street, I was really tough. 
That by my, you remember, heck, you remember that dude came in the gym like a couple years ago? This guy, I'm like older and nat- fatter than me. He went to the gym. He's like, he wants to fight somebody. Oh. So and they were like, dude, what are you telling? I'm telling you, I'll, I can beat Anderson Silver. Watch, watch. And he goes over the bag, blah, blah, blah. He starts punching the bag, and he starts to fight with Hector. And Hector's like, are you serious? <laughs> Have you seen Hector? <laughs> and they're, they're telling me, Jim, that, that, that might be me. But people do that. And they think that. And they come to church, and they look at me. They look at Austin. They look at Marty. They look at Lee. They look at the, the pastor, and they go, man, I want a family like that. Well, how do you think that happens? Yeah. We've been going to church a long time, man. We received the word and prayer a long time. We open up our lives to people. Ready? We've been in the garden. That word garden, it was the garden of Gethsemane. You know what the word Gethsemane means in the original language in Greek? Olive press. That's where the olive gets pushed. And you know what comes out? Olive oil. And when God's got you in that garden, some of you guys, uh, you'll start telling me your story and things going on, and I'll go, welcome to Gethsemane. You're in the garden right now. What should I do? <laughs> I ain't rescuing you. God's got you right where he wants you. What should I do? Pray. Yeah, but what else? Pray. But what else? Pray. And more prayer. Search scripture daily. Some of you guys, you're in the olive, you're in the garden, man. You're at Gethsemane, and you want somebody to rescue you. There's no rescue. Stay in it. Get through it. On the other side, it's the best. The best. It's the best, man. On the other side, you're a better father. You'd be prepared for that man when he comes around, and you could tell him, listen, yeah, I am lonely, and I do want somebody to hold me. But the only way you get some of this is if you go before him and say, it's forever. That's it. That's the only one getting any of this or anything else. And you've got to be ready, ladies, because he might look really good. And he might drive a nice car. And he might have a job and everything. You've got to be suited up and ready. Some of you guys have been in church for so long. I mean, the indictment on it was me, what he just said. He said, some of you guys, you ought to be teachers already. He says, I've got to start feeding you milk all over again. Now, if that indictment was to you, and you know, man, yes, I have been doing this too long to be so weak. Well, praise God, you're in the right place. And next week, we're going to look at the six or seven principles that you should know at this point. Now, for some of you guys that are two, three years old in the Lord, it's perfect. Perfect timing, perfect place. This is the stuff you're going to need to know. This is the elementary principles God says you need to know. Just for that two, three-year mark. For you guys that are six, seven years in and you don't know, doctrine of baptisms, departing from dead works, all these things. Like, what, What is that? I know. You need to know these things. This is according to the scriptures. There is stuff you need to know. Because in knowing them is that gives you the strength to live life, to have all those good things that you want. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your powerful word. And we ask you, Lord, to um, let your word sink deep into our hearts. Let your word sink deep into our minds. Prepare us, God, for next week. May those that need your healing word, not be distracted. God, I, I do want to pray um, a prayer of protection over the body because I do sense that in my spirit there are some that are here today that know they need to be here next week and the enemy is going to step up their attack on them. And they're not going to be here next week because the enemy will have picked them off. Your word declares that the enemy came just to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But you have come to give life and life more abundant, God. For those that are here that need life abundant, and may their heart be protected. Your word says that your name is a strong tower. The righteous run to you and are safe. God, I pray that each and every person here this week would know that all they need to do is speak the name of Jesus. For your name is a strong tower. God, I pray for that person that's here. Bear with me, please, one second, guys. God, I thank you so much for your, your great grace upon us. Leah, would you come up and play something, please? Something just instrumental.
Um, this week is Christmas. Tuesday, Christmas Eve, um, which as a Catholic we used to celebrate. Um, as a born-again Christian, we moved over to Christmas Day. I don't know why that is, but we did. But I just sense that there might be somebody in this place today. The, there's a restless spirit in here today, almost like there's like people who, you know, like you know, when you hear something you don't want to hear. And I'm going to assume that there's somebody in here that needs to accept Christ as their Savior, but needs to make it a public proclamation, needs to say, you know what, I really need to do this. Now, you've made, made that proclamation privately to yourself and to God, but you need to stand up before people and say, no, from now on, I'm for the Lord Jesus. There's something about doing something in the flesh that causes your spirit to yield with it. relationship with Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you have to all of a sudden start doing some crazy things. It just allows him an access to your life where he can make the changes. Because if you change the outside, the inside's still rotten. But if God changes the inside, by the time it gets to the outside, man, your life can be revolutionized. And it's time. For some of you, it's time. I just sense in here there's... It's way past time. And you've been waiting for this chance. If you want to accept Christ as your Savior and just say, you know what? I heard it put this way one time and I really liked it. And it caused me to yield as well. can't remember when you got saved, it's time to do it again. Because you think if the King of Kings, if, if God of all creation comes and takes up residence in your very spirit, I think you're going to remember that day. I think you're going to remember that day. If you are here and you just want to it doesn't matter if it's the first. Don't, don't be embarrassed. Oh, well, everybody's going to think that I'm new. Who cares? <coughs> Who cares? Just make a proclamation to the Lord. Give him his birthday gift. Greatest thing about our Lord is he only wants one thing for Christmas. You. He wants you. If you're here and you just, you just want to make sure it's... Yeah, you, I, I, <coughs> Very rarely do I, do I proclaim this spiritual stuff, but I'm telling you, I sense it in my spirit. There's more than one person here that's saying, listen, I already accepted Christ, but I really need to do this in the presence of all. If that is you, just stand to your feet and let me lead you in a prayer. Congratulations, brother. Yes. life and your spirit. He wants to do great things with your life. Good job, guys. Good job. Don't be afraid. Just, just to make it in the presence, just, just like he did. You see, he, he died on the cross. He, he probably didn't have to. God could have done a plan of salvation apart from him dying on the cross, but he didn't, did he? He stood in the presence of many and said, if he could die naked with nails in his hands on a cross, can't you? stand in the presence of a hundred people just to let everybody know you love him. Yes. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to, to let the Spirit move upon the rest of you guys. Stand. Please keep standing.
right and to make it real for this time and for good. Go ahead and stand now. Anybody else? You that are standing, repeat this prayer out loud after me, but more important than repeating it is, is meaning it in your heart. It's got to be your own words in your heart, but just repeat after me. Say, Dear God, I open my heart and I invite you inside. Be my God, be my Savior, be my friend. In my relationships, in my finances, in every area of my life. I want to serve you and do what you want me to. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I want to follow you. Give me your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Sure.